Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today I stand before you as a humbled man. A man who once made fun of Spider-Man 3 and thought it was kind of a train wreck. Times have changed. Pretend my arm is on a fictitious mantle right now. And so have I. I have since looked back on Spider-Man 3 with fresh eyes, with hungry eyes. And I have determined that Spider-Man 3 is not a bad movie, nay. It's in fact a very fine movie. It's a good movie. Dare I say, great. Before we dive into this, I think Uncle Ben would be pretty ashamed if I didn't ask you to subscribe to the channel. He, he's a big fan of mine, he tells me. So please do that now. And then when you're done, you can continue watching. And if you didn't and you continue watching, then you're just a jerk. All right, let's proceed. Sorry for calling you a jerk. There's no question, I don't think anybody's gonna argue that Spider-Man 3 is jam-packed to the brim with stuff. A lot of stuff. Too much stuff going on for a two hour and 20 minute film, especially when 15 hours of that is opening credit scenes like the other two movies, but I digress. Even though there's a cornucopia of things going on, there is a message here. A message of letting go, of forgiveness, of peace of mind. And that's what Spider-Man 3 at its core is. We have multiple characters who are struggling both internally and externally with those around them. Peter's at his prime right now. Spider-Man is beloved by almost everyone outside of J. Jonah Jameson and Eddie Brock, and he is determined to share in that happiness with MJ, who is at her lowest point in all three films. For me, Kirsten Dunst is the most compelling character here, who previously was no more than a damsel in distress. She now has layer complexity. She's a talented yet failed Broadway performer who's been looked over, who's been passed up. And she has to look on to her boyfriend who is at his peak. He's being showered with praise, given keys to the city, and even gets to make out with the new hottie on the block, Ron Howard's daughter, who I don't know how those genetics worked out, but good job. Wow. Bryce Dallas Howard's in this as Gwen Stacy. She's very much just a constant reminder that Peter has it all and that MJ's a piece of crap. Which I love MJ, but she's down on herself in this movie, damn it, and she needs to get out of it. So I've established that the story is about letting go, about forgiveness. Well, MJ has to let go of her jealousy for Peter. She has to forgive him for his selfishness because he's very much about himself in this movie. Then we have Harry Osborn, Harry's best friend. He hasn't gotten over his dad's death. I, I suppose that's fair. That's a tough thing to cope with. However, it's not fair to blame Spider-Man. I mean, his dad was kind of garbage. You know, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't the great, he wasn't father of the year. Harry's gonna be going after Peter for the majority of the film until he too learns to forgive. This is just the stuff going on with the good guys. Like I said, this is a meaty movie. There's a ton going on. J. Jonah Jameson's doing his thing still, yet he's trying to keep his anger under control. He's taking meds. It's not helping. Topher Grace is in this as Eddie Brock. He's trying to take Peter's job as a photographer. He's also trying to take his life as Venom later on, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Last and arguably least is Sandman. Cool character, cool effects. The CG's holding up decently well. It helps that Sam Raimi has a style to his movies. It's a little bit surreal. So green screen work and things like that, that's pretty obvious now it kind of has a charm to it. It doesn't take me out of the film. and In fact, it kind of enhances the experience. The whole Sandman plot really comes out of nowhere. It, uh, it sandbags you. Sorry. We find out he's the real killer of Uncle Ben. What, what, why? Why did we have to do this? Well, it's a way for Peter to confront his past, some of his trauma, and to finally learn to forgive and again, let go. Each one of the main three characters has to go through this process, and even though the way they get there is pretty messy, they still do get there. And it is compelling at the end. Could Venom, Sandman, and Green Goblin Jr. be their own movies with their own full story arcs? Absolutely. We do get a decent amount of time with these characters still. Harry has some great scenes in this. The part where he's eating that dessert with his douchey grin is just perfect. How's the pie? So good. Where the film suffers in the character department, I would say is Aunt May. I, I love Aunt May in these movies. She's a fantastic actress, great character, sage advice and wisdom, but we often only get her for these like small incremental moments, uh, two minutes tops in these scenes. I wanted my Spider-Man 2 moment. I wanted my new, I believe there's a hero in all of us. And we don't get that. I think she starts an I believe moment here, but it never catches on. It, it's not very good. It's pretty alluded to at this point that Aunt May knows he's Spider-Man. It's never said outright, but, uh, you know, through dialogue, we can kind of tell. We can kind of tell that she knows this kid's up to something. 
and she's on his side. I'm almost done talking about the story. I just have to point out that there are three villains, but they're rarely together on the screen. They find convenient ways to knock these people out, whether it's getting hit on the head and having amnesia, to getting sucked down a watery grate and then like being Timmy down the well, not being resurrected or found for another hour. Like Sandman's gone for like an hour of this movie. And then it's the Venom show. It really does feel like two or three different movies kind of wedged together. Especially the Venom stuff where there's been a ton of hearsay off camera about how Sony like demanded uh, Venom be in this and they had fights with Raimi. I don't know how much of that is true. I don't want to spill a bunch of gossip that's not. Uh, it does feel like it was kind of hammered in. There is a scene early on where the symbiote crashes down and it sticks to Peter Parker's bike, but then it goes forgotten for like another 40 minutes before it attaches to the suit and the whole thing plays out. And I have to say, Venom looks awesome. I much prefer this version, the sleek, slimy one, to that of the Venom movies. And I know the Venom movies are, you know, more comic book accurate with this bulkiness and whatnot, but I like this kind of predator alien you know it's got yeah, it's more alien looking to me uh, I don't like his voice which is just Topher for the most part and then these weird high-pitched screams uh, I'll forgive it but man that design is sweet and I am an apologist for Sam Raimi I tend to uh, go with his artistic direction over even the comic book originals I don't like the web shooters I like the fact that they're organic webbing uh, the haters will say that well why isn't the web coming out of his ass then if it's like a spider uh, because he's a human and because this is science magic it's made up fairy tale shit the webs could come out of his eyes if they wanted it doesn't need to make sense he doesn't have eight legs either all right he's not carrying little babies on his back i don't know what spiders do before i go further i should say this spider-man 3 is not as good as spider-man 2 or 1. i'm not here today to defend that i'm not here to do argue that spider-man 2 is still considered one of the greatest superhero movies of all time uh, so yeah, there's a drop because Spider-Man 2 has just this perfect focus on the relationship and on the villain and that's it there, There's nothing else going on there. Whereas Spider-Man 3 has 75 different storylines <laughs> Yet Sam Raimi manages to close them all up pretty nicely And I know there was supposed to be a fourth, but honestly, I prefer how 3 ends It's not your traditional Spider-Man ending I don't see our web slinger shooting webs off into the sky and swinging across buildings while a Chad Kroger song's playing in the background and an American flag is waving high overhead. No! This ends on a bittersweet moment with our two leads sharing in a dance, an embrace, a an emotional moment that resonates with me because we've gone with these characters for three films now. They just lost their best friend. They've been through a ton together, through ups and downs, through death, through love, and through life. The last one's not really anything. It's just a, that's just a word. We don't have a ring on the finger, but I do believe these two end up together. There's too, there's too much there. Sam Raimi leaves the door open for interpretation though. He leaves the door open for your imagination. Do you think they end up together or is there too much baggage there that they just can't? Or maybe there's too much baggage there that they're the only ones they can be with. Let's talk about other pros of this film. How about the action? Does it reach top shelf Spider-Man 2 subway fight? No. Uh, not many things do. It's unfair, really. But it has so much action. It's a quantity, not necessarily over quality, but adjacent. Because I think almost all the action scenes are fantastic, and they're varied. We have Peter Parker getting chased by Harry Osborn through the city streets at night. He, he's chucking shit at him. Peter's flying through the air, Lord of the Rings style, as the ring is falling out of place. And psh, he brings it in. Psh, he decks Harry. He's, he's clotheslining him. It's great. Later on, we have Bryce Dallas Howard hanging off the top of a building. Raimi wisely positions that camera for a perfect cleavage shot. I'm a pervert. She falls down. Ah! Spider-Man comes swinging in with that iconic Danny Elfman music playing in the background, even though Danny Elfman didn't score this film because the first two movies were such a miserable experience. He wouldn't come back for the third one, so they got someone else. Christopher Young took over. The score is still great. I almost got through that without a stumble. Peter grabs Gwen. He's falling through shit. The music and the audio are top tier. The sound effects are really noticeable during the car chase where Spider-Man's like skiing behind a, a runaway truck. He's on the ground going over things. He uses the web launchers a lot. It's in his face. He gets in there. He punches Sandman a couple times and then Sandman's like power up. 
<laughs> nails him out of the door. Oh, it's it's so good. Then they fall down the sewer and you hear like the subway noise going by. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> the echoes. And don't get me started on that final Venom takedown where Peter's smashing those pipes into the ground. And then he starts smacking him with a pipe. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the man, the myth, the meme, Bully Maguire. Let me get into my Bully Maguire mode. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. It's easy to make fun of Bully Maguire because he's so lame, but that's what gives it the charm. Parker's coming out of his shell. The anger's building up thanks to the symbiote that's attached to his suit. And for like normal people that aren't such complete dweebs, uh, they might be badass, they might be cool. But Peter's such a dork that it just gets magnified. His evil's even dorky. Uh, so it works, you know, he's coming out of the building, he's doing his, he's doing his dance and you know, yet, yet somehow his Spider-Man pheromones are attracting the women. They, they, they dig it. They dig the Bully Maguire. And upon further reflection, I'm glad that Raimi took him there, but didn't go way too far. You know, like, like a Zack Snyder situation where Peter's like killing dudes. Like, <laughs> breaks the guy's neck. <laughs> pulls the guy's legs off. <laughs> I'm going to put some dirt in your eye, mother. Beep. <laughs> Punches the guy's head off. As cool as it would be to see, it goes so against character. It's so off-brand that I, I'm glad. I'm glad this is where things ended up with the character. We still do get to see him go pretty dark. I mean, he pushes a guy up against a wall, decks MJ to the ground, and then my favorite scene of the entire film is when Osborne chucks one of those goblin grenades at him. <laughs> Parker's walking. <laughs> Osborne gets his face blown off. <laughs> then he just walks away in slow motion. <laughs> well, that was a lot. And there's still plenty more to talk about in this film. I, I, I just like scratched the surface of what's going on. There's, there's plenty to talk about here. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Do you love Spider-Man 3 or at least like it? Do you think it's overhated? Leave it in the comments, let me know. If you do hate Spider-Man 3, I'd like to know your reasons why. I, I used to be there. Not hate, I don't know if I ever hated it, but now I'm in the other camp. I, I look at Spider-Man 3, I look at this trilogy and I think, well done. It has some shaky moments, but you know what? At its essence, at its core, the characters were all done right. They were all done justice. It's crazy, it's a little messy, it's a little bonkers. But at the end of the day, it's Spider-Man and I wouldn't want it any other way. So your honor, I'm bringing back this court thing for absolutely no reason at all. I want to say, on the record, Spider-Man 3 is not a bad movie. What did it do to you? Gave you a satisfying conclusion? Gave you a bunch of new cool villains? Gave you phenomenal memes online? I say here on the record today, Spider-Man 3 is a great movie and it deserves the praise and respect we gave the other two. It's a phenomenal trilogy. Case dismissed. I can't say that, I just did. I said it before, I'm gonna say it again. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video if you had a good time. If not for me, if not for Uncle Ben, then do it for Aunt May. She'd, she'd want you to, she'd be proud if you did. And aren't we all at the end of the day just looking for the respect and admiration of Aunt May? I, th I know I am. So with that said, thanks for watching. Wow, that was fun to do. Especially twice since the first time around of recording, I didn't have my mic hooked in. I'm an idiot. If you appreciate the struggle of a working dad with a full-time job and a YouTube hobby, please think about joining me on Patreon at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies and giving me $1, $5, $10 a month to say, you know what, Adam? You're doing good. You're doing all right, kid. So thank you if you're a supporter. And if you're not, it's okay. Maybe think about it.